everybody. Welcome to the Event Professionals Network meetup slash podcast. Um, this episode is on how the event planner plans. I'm Lisa Gregory, the owner of Gregory Events and your host today, as well as Miss Marissa, who's our co-host. So Marissa, if you want to introduce yourself, and I know you had some a funny question for everybody that you were going to ask. Sure. So um, just a little bit about me real quick. So I've been in the industry for about 15 years, half on the agency side, roughly half on the brand side. Um, I've been working in a global role for almost eight years now, working for a number of brands and producing events, conferences across the globe. And I consider myself more of an event marketing strategist. So um, just a quick overview of things that we were going to cover today. Uh, a little quick intro on project management. I know we all know it, but just a nice fresh reminder. Dive into stakeholders, our fun favorite topic. Um, we'll look at planning strategies and project man management tips, and then wrap it up with some of the software and tools that we're loving right now. So as part of the registration, uh, there were a number of questions and we're going to do our best to kind of cover all those today, but we thought we would start with something we felt was very important and would set the mood uh, greatly. So we were asked what our favorite jelly bean was. And uh, for me, I am loving the Starburst jelly beans. I love them so much that I only allow myself to eat them around Easter because they're so addicting. How about you, Lisa? <laughs> I'm a jelly belly girl, so I love watermelon. Um, and then everybody, if you want to put your favorite jelly bean in the chat, buttered popcorn, that is a favorite yeah. as well. It really does taste like popcorn. Um, orange, nice. I wish, I bet orange creamsicle would be good. Coconut. We have another fellow Starburst lover. That's awesome. Not a jelly bean person. Ooh, I like the juicy pear too. Um, I'm more of a chocolate gal um, than a, than the oh we've got cherry than the sweet and sour or whatever chewy stuff. But um, so if you want to put your favorite chocolate in there too, I would love to learn what your chocolate. What's is. your uh, what's your go to sugar candy then when you get those cravings? Um, probably Sour Patch Kids. Yeah, good one. But that's my because my ten year old loves it. So I guess I probably default on that so he can eat the extras. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and dive in. So Marissa, if you want to go to the next slide and Marissa is going to kind of go from her viewpoint and then I'll kind of go from my viewpoint and fill in. And then if you guys have additional details that you guys want to fill into, you are welcome to as well. So Marissa, go for it. Sure. So just a quick kind of overview on project management. I think sometimes we forget how rooted our role as event professionals is in project management, that there is a whole separate certification for this, the PMP. So by definition, a project is a temporary endeavor taken to create a unique product, service, or result. And in our case, that unique product is the event. And a lot of times it is geared through getting things done by working with others, creating tasks and accomplishments, milestones, deliverables, and eventually that final output. So this in a nutshell describes everything we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I thought it was a great way to kind of set the tone. Um, when you also look at a project, different time scales, you're working with a number of different stakeholders, limited resources. We're constantly being asked to do more with less define schedules and budgets, which we know as much as we define them, they're constantly changing. Um, working with various staff from across the organization, which could be from the C-suite down to your colleagues. And you really do need to be working with teams and leaders that understand the project and their role and are there to help inspire and support, but also have the foresight to troubleshoot. Um, one other tidbit about project management that I really love is there's actually three sectors to it. There's project, there's program, and there's portfolio. So when we look at a project, it's a single entity. So that single event program is a collection of projects. So for us, it could be the event program, the strategy that we're using, what verticals we're going after, or your overall portfolio, which could be your various divisions. So it could be your B2B and your B2C. So the next thing that we wanted to kind of dive into was stakeholder management. Um, and so for me, I look at this basically as what's in it for them. How do I identify my advocates and my followers, those that are going to support my project and help lead it? 
And then those that are my blockers in the opponents, the ones that perhaps don't have an interest or belief in it and may challenge me either from a goals and objective perspective or from a financial one. So when you look at stakeholders, it's essentially anyone that can have a stake in your event and its success. And I think a lot of times people forget that you can have both your internal and your external. And one of the great things about the project management guidebook is they have this strategy called the um, T definition, where you look across your various verticals in your organization or outside. So for example, this might be your C-suite and your management and your sales. And then you work downward to define a more narrow approach on that. So you could be working with your sales team, but perhaps your event is in Europe. So your specific stakeholders for that event are going to be your Benelux sales team, for example. And so it's important to be mindful of where your grouping sits, both external and internal. Yep. And let's take a pause real quick, because I like this to be engaging with the audience a lot. Um, anybody have any feedback on just the general project management portion and then the stakeholders? Pavan, I know you just went through a huge event with stakeholders and all that stuff. Um, how did you get everybody bought in on your mission for your program? Um, I would say a lot of it was also came down from our leadership, our CEO, and says everybody, the success of this event is in everyone's hands. I think that was really powerful where everybody got involved. Yeah. Um, obviously, it was really hard to herd the cows in the beginning. Um, right. Everyone has their primary roles, especially when it comes to sales and everybody, everyone, the executives. But that was, you know, as we came down to it, as it, as it got pushed and pinched from leadership, everybody really stepped up. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think your team, especially on site, was pretty magical to watch. Um, so there's the stakeholders in the pre planning that have to get bought in with financially and all that stuff. Then there's the actual nuts and bolts planning of logistics. And then there's the external, like Marissa was saying, and you kind of have to truck along with every single process. Um, so I think having priorities set for each stakeholder and then a vision of what success looks like from those stakeholders will help you trickle into success. So Marissa, thank you. You want to keep going? There you go. Sure. So um, one thing that I like to do, and, and I kind of do this on my own, I don't necessarily always share it out with all of my stakeholders, but it's called the power influence grid. And sometimes you can add a third layer to this called attitude to kind of figure out where your stakeholders sit, like I said, as an advocate or a follower, or a blocker. Um, and so what this does is it looks at, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> looks at all your stakeholders after you've defined them and you figure out where they sit on this metric. So do they have a lot of interest in your event and do they have a lot of power in order to dictate, let's say, your, your budget for this? And so once you've determined kind of where they sit on this grid, you can figure out how closely they need to be managed, meaning how involved with the project or what the communication might be. So for those high interest, high power ones, you need to manage them closely. And for me, these are like my VPs, my GMs, where they don't want to be involved every week in the status meeting, but they want the updates. So I might send them a weekly or biweekly email that just lays out, hey, here's everything we're doing. You've got your low interest, low power, which again, doesn't need to be as involved, but you still need to monitor them because they have somewhat of a stake in the event. And so again, I've just used this to kind of figure out where my internal and my external stakeholders sit. So again, I can properly manage expectations as well as a communication method with them. Um, the other thing you can do, and again, this is a lot of times I'll do this when I'm working with a new client or I'm working with stakeholders for the first time that I haven't, where I'm still trying to understand their work style and their rapport with them. So as Lisa was saying, the most important thing is what is success? What do you need from them? So what you need for them could be support for the project. It could be assistance with market research. Maybe you're doing a launch event and you need to develop new demos. So you might need the product team with you. So it's understanding what each of your stakeholders brings to the table for your event. And then looking at that and understanding what their perceived attitudes might be and some of the risks. So for those that might have a high interest in the event, 
your risk could be that they're worried about the additional workload for their team. And so how do you address that and get ahead of that so you don't have any repercussions later on in the planning process? And so then once I've done that, I take a look at what my management strategy is going to be. Where do I involve them? Right. So for working on new product demos, I obviously need the demo team. So I want to figure out a demo schedule with them where we can get them into the office or the training center where we can start tweaking with some of the new products and figuring out the best way that we can create an experience for our attendees. Um, and so I'm just going to stop right there if anyone has any questions about this analysis and kind of power grid. Oh, Lisa, I think um, I think this is awesome. Thank you so much for putting it together. I think the one thing to, that I we always do is we ask, "Hey, we realize this is not your full time job doing events, doing our event, et cetera. So, what else do you have on your plate? It could be they're getting married, they're having a baby. It could be that they have another product launch or some sort of big, huge." survey announcement or something there's a lot of stuff that they're doing especially with product marketing and design and um, demand gen everybody's pulled in multiple different directions so if you can get what you need from the team in advance and then making sure that their manager is in alignment with all the other deliverables that their team has to deliver that can help early in the planning stages to say okay well we don't have enough design resources or we've never done print design before, so we need to hire a contractor. Or we want to do this VIP program, but we don't have anyone to run it. We don't have the budget for it. So it identifies a lot of that stuff at the beginning, gets everybody on the same page. So as you're trucking through the planning process, everybody knows in advance, yes, we discussed that. We're good to go. Or we discussed it. We're purposely leaving it off the table at this juncture because of xyz that's super helpful and empowers you as the planner um the other thing i like to do and is recommended a lot with with very complex projects is to figure out what your communication matrix is going to be and again you don't need to share this with all your stakeholders it could just be kept with you and your immediate planning team but it's important to set the tone early on so people understand their expectations. So kickoff meeting, for example, who needs to be there? Well, it's going to be all your stakeholders. What's the purpose? You're going to go over the goals and objectives, start defining the roles and the responsibilities, and it's going to be a one-time meeting and you need it to be face-to-face. -face. So when you can get ahead of that and the other important thing to remember here is you constantly want to monitor this because if a certain communication style isn't working, you should adjust it. So if you're finding, for example, that you're using Slack to post all of these last minute pop-up issues so people are in the know as soon as they happen and they're troubleshooting, but no one's actually checking Slack, then maybe that's not the best method um, for your team. I think you also have to be respectful of, again, the way your stakeholders communicate. So if you're working for people that are mostly in a lab, for example, maybe the email is the best way to get a hold of them, or it's through a, a Teams message or something like that. So this goes back to really understanding the people that you're working with and setting the tone ahead of time and figuring out those best, me best methods of communication. Yeah, I think the one thing I would add is once you get an agreement on where you're headed on communication and the project plan, schedule regular check-ins to ask how things are going. So they might have thought it was going to look this way, but then two or three months in, there's been some turnover in the company, budgets had shifted, but that didn't communicate down to you um, or up to you, depending on where you are. Um, things can shift and change, or they may give you some really positive feedback that's like, hey, this is really working for us. Maybe you should try it over here too. So checking in, I think we're on the agency side, but when I was internal for many, many years, I wasn't as good as I am now at doing that because I didn't treat everybody internal like a customer. If you kind of treat everyone you're working with as a customer, even if you're working internal, that's super helpful because number one, it shows that you're really servicing everybody and they love it. But number two, you kind of have that um, 
customer service mentality and ultimately it'll make you you a better performer and your event and everybody around you really and do you want to touch a little bit upon this matrix that you use okay so i love the racy not everybody does um it does take time and i will say um 90 of the time when you create it no one really ever goes back to it but it is helpful to figure out who's ultimately responsible, accountable, who needs to be consultant, and who just needs to be informed. So um, oftentimes a new CMO or a VP or something, they don't actually you know, know exactly who all the people are involved. They might want more reports and more interaction than you think they do. But if you don't ask and you don't build a racy, you don't know. And you might not know who the final decision maker is on all of a certain component of your event. But if you do build the racy, then you know, especially if you're new at a company or there's a lot of turnover. And let's be honest, right now, there's turnover everywhere. <laughs> so you're getting new stakeholders and it's like this revolving door. Um, so the racy is basically a grid. I can um, Google it and put a little... Um, example in the chat, but essentially, and I know, um, Tracy, if you want to speak to it, since it looks like you do races as well, um, I can drop an example in here, but um, I just think it's super helpful as you head into an event. Trace, did you want to say anything? Uh, absolutely. And it's a way to ensure that everybody's aware of what their role is in this event, because I find that a lot where I'll come back to like the PMM team and they're like, well, that's not really my job. And I'm like, well, in this instance it is, and you're, I was assigned you as a resource. Here's it. So having that documented is just so, it's just a huge CYA for me, just being able to cover my ass and prove that we have buy-in. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yes. And that, I mean, what other job back to Marissa, your, one of your beginning slides, what other job has so many stakeholders? Yeah. And so many people working on no other job that I'm aware of. Nobody else is spanning finance, product marketing, engineering, sales, no one except for this team. So we really, as project managers, um, are the ones that hold everything together. And that's why I go back to saying the basics are always a great foundation, especially when you're working with new stakeholders until you understand their work style and their communication method, right? You That's a huge part of this. If you want certain buy-in, a lot of times it's understanding what's in it for them. You don't want to pester them too much, but you need to keep them notified enough. So it's finding that sweet balance. Um, one of the things that I like to do, and this was something another um, brand side event manager shared with me years ago, and I've kind of tweaked it and refined it over the year, and it's it's called the stakeholder questionnaire. So a lot of times I use this um, at the beginning of the year when we're getting ready to kind of build out our portfolio and our event strategy, or I'll pull it out when we are getting ready for a really big business critical event. Um, I worked for one brand company that we did a 50 product launch. And so this was kind of the foundation on how we started. And it's basically an eight question survey that helps me understand where all my stakeholders lie. So it's helping to create alignment and establish a strategic direction before we actually get into the planning. So I send this out and I usually like to use like a survey monkey, keep it short, quick, something they can do on their phone to understand what's important for them. So how do they measure success? How do they feel that we're um, differentiated in the marketplace? Um, what kind of activities might they see this year on our event program or at a specific event, which, you know, if you're working with sales, it might be dinners with dealers or specific clients from certain regions, you know, things like that. And so it helps me understand where their minds are at. And so then what I do is I take all that information and make a master document. And then I bring them all together in a room and without sharing who said what, I show them how aligned or how far off we, we are. And so we end up leaving that meeting with somewhat of a direction, a clearly defined roles and responsibilities. And it sets us up to really get ahead in the planning process and address any issues that might come up before we actually get into some of the logistics stuff. Now this is magical. 
Um, I know Tracy was like, can you share this? <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, I'm, I'm a big believer in templates. You will see. <laughs> I love it because it's all documented. So to get people to fill it out, what I would do is just schedule a meeting, honestly, because people oftentimes are like, what do you mean? I don't know what that is. And then you don't get them back. Um, if some people just send it back, that's great. But I usually for stuff like this, I'll schedule a 30 minute meeting, explain what it is, explain how important it is. And then before they leave the meeting, I want the document back. Yeah, I, I like that idea. I think sometimes for me on the brand side, it's really hard to get all of my specific, let's say C-suite stakeholders in a room at the same time because schedules are so tight. So when I can do something like that, I think it's a great way to go. The other option is if you can be really thorough in your email so they understand the the importance of it. And the other piece is, is when you implement things like this, you have to understand that it's a new activity. And so it might take a little bit of time to get buy-in, but once they see the value in it, when you send it out, you'll start to get those responses pretty quick. Yeah, that's awesome. Any comments from anyone? Any questions? Um, hey, uh, Lisa, this is Akhil. Uh, Marissa, this is great. Um, one addition to that, that, you know, that um, I've found success with is when you uh, start engaging with the stakeholders, you also let them know what a shared success looks like uh, at the end of the event, because most of the times, like say, for example, if I'm asking for a resource from like solutions team or product team, they're like, what's in it for me or for my, my team. We just like, you know, send resources and you folks don't even like let us know what happened, like, you know, after the event or like, you know, not include them in the debrief or, you know, and, and that gets difficult for them to show uh, the justification as into why I need to like, you know, send a solutions engineer, like who's critical, who's always like talking to customers um, and that kind of like builds upon, but like along with this, like if you can just add like one more that says like how a shared success uh, looks like and how they contributed and what they would get like to their teams to like, you know, from this, from, from the event uh, is, is something that, um, you know, really helped me to get buy-in and get the resources. Yeah, resources are key because we can't do our jobs without the resources. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think one thing that's really helped me team is, um, and this would probably come from your head of demand, Jen, or your CMO is just a either weekly or bi-weekly campaign update or planning update, which would include everything to your key stakeholders. So those regular updates that are documented, we need this, this would perform this way, et cetera will help empower your teams, links to different white papers or whatever, because we're not just involved in like one singular event. Some of us are planning 75 events a year. So, you know, and, and you can adjust this per what events you're working on. All right, Miss, Miss Marissa, I want to keep going? Sure. So um, we wanted to kind of dive in some of the of the planning strategies and kind of project management tips that we've found to be successful throughout the years. And I think for me, the, the number one motto I always have is always begin with the end in mind. Um, and so with that, I like to work backwards. And so regardless of the event side, these are basically my first three steps. So I create that checklist starting with the end result, the actual event, working backwards to figure out all the things that need to happen in order to get the event off the ground. And then I'll go through and kind of dissect it by pre-planning, on-site, and post-event. So I basically am just doing a brain dump on everything. And then I am starting to build out my timeline. Again, working backwards to figure out when I need to hit certain milestones in order to make sure that we're successful. And I am sure I am not the only one that does this, but cushioning. If something is due on the 10th, I am going to tell my stakeholders it's due on the 5th because I'm probably going to get it on the 8th. Um, there's no shame in that. My secret is I don't ever let them know that I do that because they're always going to be late. Um, and so I think cushioning, if that's my one tip to you, do it with all of your deliverable dates because we are always the last line of defense and our event date doesn't change. And so for our own kind of mental health, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves too. 
And then lastly, you know, budget. So this is a document that should be constantly refined. And so once you kind of have everything you need to do, you figure out when it all has to be done by, you need to start putting numbers against everything. So developing that budget. So then you can go in and figure out what you need to ask for, then constantly managing it in case you had issues where maybe your marketing needs to be a little bit more versus your uh, shipping, for example. And then at the end, you need to make sure you reconcile again for your records and your historical data. I am someone that believes in market research, industry research, historical data. This is going to come in handy when you're asking for budgets. Why? If you are looking to do a 200 person event and you haven't done it before, but it's in Nashville, for example, you can go and find resources of people that have done similar events and what it costs. You can use industry benchmarks. I've done this before when I've been asking for budget on the brand side or pitching proposals to clients. If you have the data and the research, it's going to help with your, with your case. It is your best friend. 100%. Um, the other thing I am a huge advocate of is templates, 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 templates. It not only creates consistency and streamlines processes, but it's going to save you time. I am sure most of you out there are a team of one or a team of two. If you're lucky and have more than that, wow, I applaud you. Um, but a lot of times it's we're very lean. And so I have found, again, with my budgets, with my stakeholder questionnaires, make these things and reuse them. You don't need to recreate the wheel every single time. And for me, I'm just going to share a couple of the templates that I have found over the year to be extremely successful. Um, my budget template was an example I took from the CMP when I was studying for it. And I have found it to be so successful. No matter what company I go to, I bring this there with me. Um, part of the reasons I love it is it basically breaks down your event into specific bu uh, buckets and it allows for variance. So I can see how far off we were from our estimate and our actual. If you are doing, let's say, CES and you have this from two years ago, this same budget outline, you can see how much money you spent in your shipping and your marketing and your housing. So when you go to ask for budget the following year, you can add an increase for inflation, but you have a general idea of how much you're going to need. If you are doing a 20 by 20 booth, for example, at a brand new show you've never been to, but you've done a 20 by 20 exhibit at another show, it becomes your resource, your reference. So again, you can kind of adjust for location and, and maybe additional staff or things like this. But I have had positive feedback from C-suite stakeholders about using this format. I highly recommend it. It breaks it down by expense detail. And then on the first tab, I include an overall expense summary. So if I'm sending that again to leadership or management and they don't want to get into the nitty gritty, they can go to the first tab and just see a quick overview of here's how much we spent, here's the actual, here's the estimate, and here's how much we were off by. Yeah, this is perfect. I think one other thing to know is because you're doing this early, you know, like PR activities are not coming out of your budget. Right. Because that's the one that always sneaks in. Who's paying for PR? <laughs> yes. PR exactly. is paying for PR. Um, and then things like T and E or swag, right? Like you're gonna have this VIP event, it's you're doing this dinner, and then all of a sudden they want to spend a hundred dollars on swag and they're looking at you like we need money, and you're like, me. If you do these exercises at the beginning and make it visible, be careful who you make it visible to. <laughs> Maybe not everybody has to see it, but you know what I mean? If you have these conversations early, then you can easily say, oh, $100 swag item sounds lovely, but that will have to be for next year out of your budget. Or if you want to make it work this year, maybe you can do something that's $25 or whatever. So um, that is super duper helpful. And I love the year over year or even just reusing the budgets. Has anyone else had any luck with budget planning? I know um, financial changes have been all over the place. So any fun stories to share? I'm sure budgets are just being increased right now, right? <laughs> I'm in a situation where they gave me a budget for a net new event that was very small, uh, like $100,000. And as we got into it, it became obvious that that was never going to be enough money to create an event of the caliber. Um, so I'm in a situation where like just the wind is at my back and I'm just spending, spending, spending to make it happen. And then asking for forgiveness later, which is a terrible way to do business. But 
I'm finding that the budgets they're giving me are just laughably small. Yeah. So I can, I mean, I'm happy to talk offline about this. I've run into this again on the brand side when I'm, you know, understanding what's coming from my agency and how much things are going to cost and then how I'm figuring out how to pitch it to my stakeholders. And a lot of times I create three buckets. So good, best, better. And I'm like, these are based on industry numbers. Here's where you can sit. Here's what you're going to get for that output. So what I would do if I was you is show them what they could actually get for 100K, for 200K, for 300K. And I think this is where we go back to having to be those project managers where we have to reel in expectations, right? If you're not going to give me more money, this is all you can have. Because at the end of the day, you have to remember, we make these detailed budgets because they're going to come at us when we're like a penny off or two cents off, or you didn't get the conversion right. So as long as you document everything, and I think you're open with your communication, that is that is the best way to kind of safeguard and cover yourself. Yeah, I love the better best. You know, you're going to give me a Chuck E. Cheese budget and then want something, yeah. you know, PGA quality is not going to happen. I yeah, I, I do that all the time when they come out and say they want to do a big product launch at a show in some exotic place. And it's like, you can't actually do it for that much money. It's yeah. not realistic. Yeah. And be careful on sponsorships this year. So Leslie just said, be careful or include your sponsorship revenue. So sponsorship mm -hmm. revenue is down. Um, we sell a lot of sponsorships and people are just not buying in as much this year. So be very careful on that. And same with your registration revenue. So sales isn't used to making folks pay. It's just, and then your CMO wants people to pay. So those two things need to be in very tight alignment before you start rocking and rolling on your budget. Um, and then just be honest with sales. Say, hey, you guys, in order to make it, well, you can have 100 free tickets or whatever, or you can send 10 people, but you can't send your normal. This is, you know, just we're in a different time right now. And I think some people aren't seeing that as clearly as event planners because we spend more money. Yeah. And, and I will say I've learned over the years, the best way to communicate and to get sales to understand is through numbers. That is, that is how they respond. That is how they answer. So if you keep everything financial numbers, you're going to get a response. Yeah. Agreed. Um, and if anybody has any questions like this, so the event professionals network is a resource for everybody. So if you have questions about budgets or sponsorship sales or registration numbers, what you can do is you can drop your question in the event professionals network and people will go through and answer it for you. So feel free to drop any question there. We'll do our best to help. So I, I just wanted to share kind of one other template because it kind of goes into my planning strategies and it's my initial and final details. And um Sometimes the initial details are kind of what you might see on a website, you know, the no before you go, but not very detailed, not as uh, kind of covering all your bases and your final confirmation might be closer to that no before you go document. But um, working again on the brand side and even on the client side where you're kind of pulling together all the information that your client needs, I create in the body of an email, um, basically everything that my attendees need to know before they come. And the reason I do this is to get ahead of those questions that I know are going to come from my eternal and sometimes external stakeholders and limit how many people are stopping by my desk or trying to Skype me. It's, it's really about managing, again, my own kind of planning process and my mental health. So it gives them everything they need in order to like, what's the dress code? What days do they need to book their travel by? When are they going to get their badge registration or their final confirmation details? And the other great thing about this is because it's in the body of the email, if I end up having new attendees come, I just go back into my send folder and I reforward it to the new people that have been added. And so I don't need to take the time to write a whole new email explaining what these new attendees or new support team need to know in order to um, get their travel and housing arrangements made before they head on site. Then the other piece that I like to do, I call it the final confirmation details. And so this is a very detailed PDF that I send out along with a bunch of other attachments. Um, and I usually do this about 10 to 14 days before the event goes live. It includes everything they could possibly need to know. Again, so I'm not getting all those calls and the texts and 
it also is a nice reference point for me in case I forget something, I can just pull up the document and see what I need. And so it has a detailed staffing schedule. It lists out all of the ancillary events that we're doing, where they're happening, who's supposed to be attending them, any of the sponsorships. Um, it's just a really, really detailed and thorough document. And then in addition to that, I'll include things like our contact list. Um, if we have specific scripts for a demo or something experiential that we're doing, for launching new products, I might include the text specs and so people can kind of read up in this. I literally just kind of go overboard and give them everything, including the kitchen sink, so I can, again, avoid those emails, those calls. And if I am in a bind and I need something, I know it's on here, so I can personally just go into my email and pull it up. So the budget and these kind of initial and final details have been a huge success with a lot of my event planning over the years. Yeah, it's empowering the people in every which way or direction. Yeah. Um, you use Google to create an FAQ in a Google Doc where you can go in and share the link, but it's just viewable to everybody, then you can add to your FAQ. So if you send your pre-show email 14 days in advance and you get a series of questions, right? You're getting those, you just drop them in the FAQ in that section. And then if people ask questions, you can say, go to the FAQ, go to the FAQ. Or what it does, if you create a Slack channel for all the people going to that event, other people will start answering those questions for you because they're in the FAQ or someone's already asked them. So um, empowering the people early will save you time and headache. And then one thing I also do, Marissa, is right before the show, I send that email again a couple of days before that's like, hey, here it is again, <laughs> just in case you're taken off. And then I also do a calendar invite with all the same information because everybody learns in a different way. And then I also put it in Slack and I pin it. So literally it's like, <laughs> you can't miss it. Um, so I love the 10 to 14 day thing. It'll save you tons of time. Good job, Marissa. Yeah. And I found that once I kind of started implementing this, regardless of where I work, people got used to it and they started asking when those emails were coming, like a little bit before normally I would send it. So it, it's one of those habits that once they like it, it kind of keeps going. Um, the other thing that I always kind of find successful in the planning strategy are my pre-show meetings. And so, you know, what Lisa was saying, depending on the complexity of the event, I might just do a quick call if it's a smaller event with like my sales team, just to kind of go over things really quickly. Or if it's a very complex event, I'll bring everyone that's supposed to come to support it. And we'll do a webinar and walk through all those final confirmation details. So everyone knows what's going on. Everyone knows what time they have to be there. Everyone knows what their responsibility is. Um, I also like to add in on-site meetings. Again, if these are these larger, more complex, you know, product launches or brand activations where I like to have us put ourselves in the shoes of the attendee and go through each aspect of it to make sure all of the planning has been done correctly. Because as much as you try to troubleshoot and think through things, sometimes when you get on site, things are going to be different. Like maybe there's suddenly a, a door you weren't expecting where you're supposed to be putting up a graphic and you can't cover it because it's a fire safety issue. Um, and so just kind of walking through and making sure that everything matches the way that you planned it and it's still a really good experience for the attendee. And then I think this goes without saying, we all know this, our, our tech rehearsal. I've done a lot of software launches and I will always say have an analog backlog, backup because you just never know. I was working in a, a demonstration room and we were trying to demo a video call, which wasn't always working. And so we had to kind of come up with a backup plan. A lot of it was due to the internet con uh, connectivity at the convention center. And so you know, just making sure sometimes you got to go back to the basics and keep things simple. What is your analog backlog? And it could be something as simple as Photoshop or a three ring binder that has all of your details and your graphics and everything else you might need for your show, you know, in your booth or at the venue. Yeah, I think putting yourself in the attendee shoes is important. So for example, if you know your team has never been to AWS reInvent before, walking them through how long it's actually going to take them to walk there, to check in, to find your booth. I do, when you get to the beginning of the trade show, I'll actually do a video that says like, hey, this is where we are in the hall and video it and then drop it in Slack. That's like, hey, th because people just get lost. So 
and you don't have to do it just for trade shows. You can do it for all sorts of stuff. Um, but I think that's a good reminder. Just put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. And then I just wanted to kind of share my planning strategy for some of the larger events. I work more on what I call business critical events. So those large scale brand activation, product launches, SKOs. And so this is a strategy that I have found successful throughout the years. And it all begins with research and development. Um, so going back and looking at historical data from a past event like this or a similar event um, to figure out what was the attendee experience, what worked well, right? Maybe we bought a series of sponsorships, but the email sponsorship was the only one that saw a return. And so using that data to figure out what the new strategy is going to be. And I start this by creating a working PowerPoint. And so I just create slide after slide, and it's just a constant evolving document. So once I've kind of nailed down my strategy in the PowerPoint, I'm going to meet with my high interest, high power stakeholders. And even though I've got all of this information in my deck, it doesn't mean I'm actually going to share everything with them. My goal is to be prepared for any possible question that my leadership, my executive team could ask me, but I don't need to take them through everything. So if we're going to do, let's say CES, for example, and they have a question about show metrics, right? I may not have included that in my initial presentation with them, but I've got a slide and it's hidden in my deck so I can pull it up and I can speak to it. And so it's making sure you do that research so you can get your budget approval and you make sure that you have a strategy that is very directional, but broad in nature to start. And so once I kind of get their buy-in and say, here's what I want to do, and they're like, great, go do it. I start to get my team together to figure out who the rest of my stakeholders are that need to be involved. And we work together to figure out what kind of tactics. And again, it's in this PowerPoint that is constantly changing, constantly evolving. I may have started with five slides. I'm up to like 50 now. And once I've kind of done that, I then determine and define my team leads, right? Because we can't manage everything. And if you're doing these large events, chances are you've got dealer dinners or you've got a demonstration room. And so I figure out a lead for each one of those sub projects within my large scale event project. And I work with them to make sure that all of the checklist is defined and we kind of, you know, go over it weekly to figure out, are you hitting these deliverables? So being realistic about the number of things that has to happen with this event and figuring out the best way to delegate, but also monitor. And then on the flip side, what I found for these larger events is limiting access to planning documents, ones that can be edited. So I have in the past had documents where people could go and type in their updates and through no fault of their own, accidentally put it in the wrong section or deleted stuff. So I found it best to keep that team really lean, maybe one or two people that can go in and kind of update documents that can be shared to the wider group or that are taking your meeting minutes that are sharing again to the wider group. Because the last thing you want to happen is this 50 you know, PDF document you've been working on is suddenly missing half of your strategy and then you get called in for a status update and you don't have it. So this for me has just been one successful way I've dealt with some of the larger meetings. Um, one thing we've been doing recently to Marissa and team is for, because we work internationally a lot and everybody's on a different time zone, it's harder to get people to attend every single meeting that you have. And we were getting things that were delayed. So we started creating, um, decision slides. So we would create all of the data and all the information. And then we would create a slide that says decisions needed for this particular thing, and we would list all the information and the decisions that we needed and the date. And then we would ping them in there and say, hey, stakeholder here, here's all the information for review. If you can attend this meeting or meetings, great. But either way, this is when we need everything from you and here are all the details. That has been super helpful working on different time zones. And we've been getting really good response from that. One thing I would caution is that your slides can get very long. <laughs> we have decks that get very, very long. So that can sometimes turn folks off because they're like, ah, this is too much for me. So knowing your audience and what works for your audience and is really, really helpful. And then knowing when to create another deck, but making sure everything links back. So if you create another resource or another deck, create a slide in your master deck that says, this is the, all the information on design and here are the trackers and the information that you need 
so that every cell still lives in one deck, but can sprawl out a little bit. Um, that way, like Marissa was saying, if design needs to edit a specific thing, they own it. If finance needs to, it's a specific thing, but everything can be found in your master deck. Welcome to the Zen, <laughs> folks. <laughs> Um, so for smaller events, I try to automate as much as I can, and I am of the mindset, just get it done real quick, finish it, remove it from your plate, or if you can delegate it. So as Lisa was saying, I'm a big advocate of calendar reminders. What I have found um, really helpful for some of my smaller sales events is using teams and creating a channel within teams that is only open to those attending the event. And teams gives you an option to go in and create, um, like tasks and you can assign it to a certain person with a due date. And so you don't have to do anything. It sends the automatic reminders. So then you can just go in and check progress um, to make sure people are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they'll handle the nagging, the reminders. So that's one of the um, softwares I like to use for some of the smaller events. And again, with the um, templates, I create a lot of word templates, whether it be invitations or uh, email drafts that my sales team can go in and just modify depending on their audience and the, and the event. So again, it becomes less work on my plate because I've done a lot of the upfront planning for this group of, of events. Yeah. Um, one thing, Tracy, thank you for dropping this in here. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to just put a note in here, but one thing that can kill your project management is having multiple documents for the same information. There, We have a major rule. There's only one source of truth. That's it. If you have another doc that you open with a different agenda or speaker tracker or something like that, we now have kind of sometimes have this rule that's like you have to get approval to create any new document or spreadsheet from the project management lead because we've had situations where you know product marketing needs to work on the agenda they don't want to mess anything up so they've created their own version and then that's not in the doc and then the main content lead doesn't know what's going on. And then you've got like eight different content people trying to figure out what's going on and nobody knows what the source of truth is. So one single source of truth is good. And then I do love the rule that the project lead sets the planning doc, the master spreadsheet and creates all those things and gets approval and no one else is kind of allowed essentially to create additional docs unless they get approval. Yeah, and I want to be mindful of time. We have about 10 minutes left. So I want to quickly just go through this and then we'll talk software. But um, just a couple of high level things that I find work with the status meeting is I like to send out the agenda ahead of time so people know what we're going to be talking about and who needs to be presenting. I like to allocate one person, if it's not myself, to be the note taker and then to follow up with that meeting with what I call the meeting minutes. And again, this is sometimes where I might include those high interest, high power stakeholders that don't need to be in the meeting, but they can still see what happened. And so those meeting minutes should really ideally go out by the end of the day. Um, calendar invites, I do it with staff meetings, with all of our planning meetings, when they're supposed to be at the booth. So any deliverables like budget approval or graphics, um, post-event questionnaires. So I like to create them for the attendee, for the actual staff that went and supported and for my planning team. And again, this information gets built into my historical data so I can figure out where we need to adjust for the next one. With forecasting for my own personal self, you know, on a daily basis, I try to block out time in my morning where I can just think about the things I have to do and prefer that I only do meetings on certain days of the week so I can actually give myself time to work because I think sometimes when you're pulled into a meeting and then having to go back and forth between doing actual planning and project managing, sometimes it can be a little much. Um, and whenever I can, kind of trying to build that out on a monthly scale so I can see what events are coming down the pipeline when, so I can figure out what actionable deliverables I have for myself that week or that day. And then Lisa, do you want to go into some of your sprint planning? Yeah. So if you haven't done sprint planning, there's a whole book on it. So just, I think I can grab it, but sprint planning is um, amazing. It is basically just one meeting at the beginning of the week to go through all the deliverables with stakeholders and then one meeting towards the end of the week to basically come back and report in what was accomplished 
are there any blockers and then kind of set your goals for the end of the week going into the following or the next week um we save time money and headache by doing sprint planning um highly highly recommend that you grab the book um do you want me to go into habit stacking too yeah that'd be great so habit stacking is something that I, I'm a huge, like, I love to hack all the things. Um, I started it with exercise, actually. So here's a great example. Every time you go get coffee in the morning, you have this habit of adding your sugar and adding your creamer and all that stuff. So every time you do your weekly reports, for example, for your job, a habit stack would be you do your weekly reports, you take that information and you build your agenda with the weekly report at the exact same time and you just get used to that and then you send it out to your team that says hey y'all here's the agenda for next week please add your agenda items by x date but you can have it stack with everything so kind of thinking in the back of your head i usually just put a little note like a sticky how am i doing on my habit stacking for the week and i block out time to make sure I'm getting stuff done. There's all sorts of ways to have it stack. You can do it at work and in your personal life. And then um, Marissa, if you want to go into color coding, I did put a little bit of stuff in the chat about that. Yeah. So this is one I don't use as much unless it's for myself with kind of um, sometimes go to market meetings, to be honest with you, where I can see what's due, what's late, what's in jeopardy of being late. And so for me, it's just a color coding system. Red is like, oh my gosh, it's late. Obviously it's red. Yellow is it's behind, but we're still available to hit that deliverable target. And then green is everything's okay. We're still on pace. Um, that's the way I've mostly used it in the past. Yeah. We add another color teal. So for teal, that means that it's been updated. So for example, say a title change has been made for a session and it needs to be updated on the website, on the trackers, in the deck, et cetera. The event lead would put it in teal and that signifies to us to go in and update it in all the places. And then when we've done updating it, we turn it back to the regular color white or whatever. So that that helps us with um, project management flow of making sure that all the updates have gotten updated everywhere else, but the person making the updates doesn't know always where everything trickles down. <laughs> so if they just make the update and they don't tell anyone, that's not very helpful. So that's where Teal comes in. Great. Um, and then for last minute issues, so I always like to have a contingency plan and a lot of that is rooted with setting aside money. So I know that I can just put some money at it when, you know, when you're like a week out, there's not much else you can do, but prevention is another thing. So it's also thinking through areas and kind of doing a risk assessment with your event to figure out where something might flare up. And then in terms of management, one of the things that I've started doing is if my stakeholder comes to me and wants to add something to an event and I say, well, realistically, we don't have resources, we don't have time, we don't have budget, but they're saying they really want it. I, my response has been, what are we dropping? So another way to kind of deal with these last minute asks and issues is if this is what you want it, this is what's important, what are we dropping? So being realistic about that. Yep. And then I always start a retrospective. So you can say, hey, I love that idea. Um, I'm going to add it to the retrospective so we can include that in the budget for hopeful approval and make sure that we do it next time. But for right now, we're, we're locked. I also let everybody know at the beginning of the planning stages that most everything needs to be done, 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 <laughs> done 30 days before your show. So all ideas are great ideas, but if that idea comes in 30 days before the show, your percentage of getting the yes is way lower right? You need those ideas to come in earlier. Um, building and flexibility for that is helpful in tech because there's a lot of ideas that come late, but you don't want to, you know, be a jerk and have to be like, no, 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 no all the time. So letting people know in advance, you got to get to us early. You got to be engaged. Um, is helpful because most even CMOs tend to not know an event is happening until 30 days before. And that's why getting those stakeholder meetings on your calendar are very important. <laughs> really, wait, uh, I'll never forget the week before we had a 
VP of marketing say, okay, we're going to get everybody in a room and we're going to brain dump and get everything done in the last week before. I'm like, everything's done, dude. You should not be doing anything the week before unless it's printing name badges. <laughs> That's about it. Yeah. All right, go, go for it, Marissa. Okay, so we'll just kind of quickly talk about some of the software and tools that we're liking. So my motto is if something isn't working, don't use it. So just because they've always used it doesn't mean that you actually have to. And sometimes you don't actually need to go digital, you can go analog. So for me, I think, again, the two biggest parts of our job are communication and organization. So for the communication aspects, some of the things I've liked are Teams, SharePoint, OneNote. Sometimes I like to go back to Excel, man. Um, Google Docs, I put in there. I know Lisa's a big fan. Um, coming from the brand side, it's something we often can't use because of security issues. So a lot of times I find when I work with my agencies, I've got to download it and then I've got to move it to SharePoint. So not ideal, but again, this is where knowing your stakeholders comes into play. Um, Microsoft Project and Smartsheet. So I've used both of these and I highly recommend them. I saw an article last week, Smartsheet now integrates with Teams. So again, if you're on the brand side, highly recommend either of these. Um, they're also very intricate softwares to learn. And so if you're going to go this route, we're going to start putting your events in project management software, having a couple people that go and do the tutorials and really understand it. Because if you start getting a lot of hands in here, chances are you're going to see a lot more tasks that maybe weren't supposed to happen. Um, deliverable dates, maybe not lining up correctly, but I do like both of these because they offer the ability to see where your resources are going to overlap. So you can also forecast where you might need to bring in contractor help. Again, if you're on the brand side or maybe you're on the agency side and you need to bring in more of your internal employees to support a client. Um, I also like Trello boards. It's a little bit more visual where you can basically go in and set it up. Here's what we're doing. Here's what we're working on. Here's what's done. So it's a little bit easier if you need to have more hands in the pot. Um, and then lastly, I am still a big component of whiteboards. So my team will just go and we have a master board. We'll write everything we need to do. So we kind of see it in the morning when we come in and it's, it's just a nice reminder. We check things off as we go. I worked with one event planner that used to cover her desks in post-its and it was color coded. And my biggest fear was I was going to lose something. Um, and then the last two I always love is a graphics wall where if I'm working on documents or messaging where I need input, I create a wall and just put it all up there. And so as people go by, they can jot their notes and things that need to be changed. And then I'll just go collect it at the end of the week. And Monday, I know what I'm working on. And then lastly is my show binder. I've said this before, where you print out everything that you need for the show. So you have that one resource where if you're on site or somebody swings by your desk, they can kind of just check your, your manual for the, for the show. Yep. And we do all this as well, except for we do it all virtually. So if you need to do a whiteboard, you can do whiteboards virtually. There's apps for that. There's uh, virtual post-its, virtual graphic walls. All that stuff can be done virtually if you're working internationally and don't have an office. And then the last thing we were just going to talk about, and I know we've, we're running out of time, but um, how do we stay on top of event tech? And a lot of times it's finding the time to vet the software before you actually bring it in. If you are doing international shows and you're working with a company that is in the EU, you're going to need to know about the data privacy and the security, which again, if you're on the brand side, is going to be a big issue with some of these new softwares coming up because how are they hosting data? How are they storing it? Um, but if you're able to kind of vet stuff ahead of time before you might need it, it makes it a little bit easier to get budget approval because you already know how it works, what value you're going to get for it. And so this is the stuff you can then pitch to your stakeholders. So um, with that, if there's any other questions for us or any other comments. Or